So last week, as we celebrated Easter, I particularly focused on a story about a journey. Two lesser known, one even unnamed disciples, and they're wrestling with each other, discussing this news of Jesus being resurrected. And then they are actually joined on that journey along with the resurrected Jesus. And I, I mentioned to you that I'm intrigued by their relationship with each other and with Jesus. And that it's kind of inspired me to spend some weeks diving deep into the idea of relationships. That we are connected with each other uh, through family relationships, through friendship relationships, through church relationships, and we can support and strengthen each other in this fabric of relationships. So this morning and in the weeks ahead, this morning we're going to talk about valuing relationships, and then next week growing relationships, the week after communicating in relationships that bless, then serving in relationships, and then mentoring relationships. This is a basic part of how we think about ourselves as church because relationships that bless are so fundamental to our faith journey. And I'll tell you one of the places where I really think about how valuable and important relationships are. It's in times when we think about end-of-life issues. As a pastor, I am often invited in and, and a part of people's lives when they're wrestling with end-of-life issues. And one of the things that's always a part of that is relationships. In fact, I have never had anybody wrestling with end-of-life relationships who said, bring me my seashell collection. I got to see that one more time. Or I've never had a guy contemplating end-of-life issues go, bring me my tools. I got to check out my tools one more time. Or I've never had a lady in that kind of situation go, show me my wardrobe one more time that I've been collecting over my life. Now, it's relationships that are valuable. It's spending time with family and friends in those situations or when I help someone prepare for a funeral, when, when the chips are really down, when things are stressful, it's relationships that really matter. And so I want to dive deep into our relationships and think about them. And this morning, um, I want to do that by looking at two who are often referred to as the best friends in the Bible. Uh, this would be uh, David and Jonathan in the Old Testament, the best friends in the Bible. If you don't remember or kind of know the background to David and Jonathan, let me fill you in. So the Jewish people desired to have a king. God said, I want to be your king. You know, just let me be the one to rule you. But they were like, oh, all the other kingdoms have a king, a human king. We want one also. So they chose Saul as their king. And they really didn't choose all that well. Saul had some challenges. I think we would probably look at Saul now and say he may have even had some mental health issues. Saul wrestled with depression uh, Saul had some anger problems, and he definitely experienced a lot of envy and jealousy. Saul did. Um, and one of the things that started to agitate him in his life was David. David of David and Goliath. That's actually where they became introduced to each other uh, was in that particular story. Um, and David started to get close with the king's household. As I mentioned, Saul suffered with depression, and David played the lyre, kind of a little mini harp well, and he was invited often to come and play for Saul and to soothe his depression. Well, 
David became so close that he kind of rose in the ranks of Saul's uh, workers. He actually led armies, and he did such a good job that uh, David's star kind of rose, and Saul's fell, and Saul did not like this, um, became very jealous of David. But at the very same time, as David became close with Saul's uh, household and, and at the, 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 the royal court, David became best friends with Jonathan, who was Saul's son. Um, what's interesting about that, as David's star was rising, and, and even by God's plan, it looked like David was moving toward being the king, Jonathan would have been the logical one as the son of the king to rise into that position. But that didn't bother Jonathan. He loved David. Even though his father hated David, he loved David. It's one of those interesting little human dynamic things. I'm not the first to note that you don't have to watch soap operas or, or read fiction about, you know, kind of crazy stories. You can read the Bible and find all these interesting dynamics like Saul and Jonathan and David. So I want to read to you one of the, the, the descriptions, one of the stories about Jonathan and David and how close their friendship was. This is from 1 Samuel, the 20th chapter. David fled from Nioth in Ramah. He came before Jonathan and said, What have I done? What is my guilt? And what is my sin against your father that he is trying to take my life? I haven't done anything wrong. I've just tried to do my best and here your dad's after me. He, Jonathan, said to him, Far from it, you shall not die. I will protect you. In today's vernacular, I've got your back, bro. I will look out for you. My father does nothing, either great or small, without disclosing it to me. And why should my father hide from me? Never. But David also swore, your father knows well that you like me. And he thinks, do not let Jonathan know this or he will be grieved. He's worried that Saul will hide his plans from his son. But truly, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, there is but a step between me and death. He is in fear from his life from Saul. Then Jonathan said to David, Whatever you say, I will do for you. Whatever it is you need for me, I will be there for you. David said to Jonathan, Tomorrow is the new moon, and I should not fail to sit with the king at the meal. But let me go so that I may hide in the field until the third evening. If your father misses me at all, then say, David earnestly asked leave of me to run to Bethlehem, his city. For there is a yearly sacrifice there for all the family. He's creating this little test situation not being at the king's court, to find out how Saul feels about him. If he says, good, it will be well with your servant. But if he is angry, then know that evil has been determined by him. Therefore, deal kindly with your servant, for you have brought your servant into a sacred covenant. They have a holy promise, a friendship between the two of them with you. But if there is guilt in me, kill me yourself. Why should you bring me to your father? In other words, if I've done anything wrong, just kill me yourself and we'll be done with this. Jonathan said, far be it from you. If I knew that it was decided by my father that evil should come upon you, would I not tell you? Then David said to Jonathan, who will tell me if your father answers you harshly? Jonathan replied to David, Come, let us go out into the field. So they went out into the field. Jonathan said to David, By the Lord, the God of Israel, when I have sounded out my father about this time tomorrow or on the third day, if he is well disposed toward David, shall I not then send and disclose it to you? But if my father intends to do you harm, 
the Lord do so to Jonathan, and more also, if I do not disclose it to you and send you away so that you may go in, in safety. Basically, let God do to me what my dad has planned for you, and worse, if I don't stand by your back. May the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. If I am still alive, show me the faithful love of the Lord. But if I die, never cut off your faithful love from my house. In other words, even if either of us die, we'll promise to look out for the family and the relatives of the other. That's how deep their friendship goes. Even if the Lord were to cut off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth, thus Jonathan made a covenant Again, this sacred promise between the two of them, uh, sacred covenant with the house of David saying, may the Lord seek out the enemies of David. Jonathan made David swear again by his love for him, for he loved him as he loved his own life. That's how close their relationship is. Jonathan said to him, tomorrow is the new moon. You will be missed because your place will be empty. And the story unfolds as Jonathan protects and takes care of David. What an amazing friendship and relationship the two of them have. So I want to look at this text a little bit and and help us see what it has for us in terms of valuing relationships that bless, how important they are. Well, one of the things we see in this story, and we actually see this all throughout the Bible, um, is that relationships that bless are central to community. They're central to, to what we develop as a faith community, that we have these relationships with each other. You could go back all the way to the beginning of the Bible and look at the relationship between Adam and Eve um, and their connection with each other. Um, You could move on further and see the relationship between Abraham and Sarah and how they support each other. You could look through the history of the Bible at Moses and his his brother Aaron and how each of them had different roles in leading the new Jewish community. We could look at David and Jonathan and how central their relationship was with each other. Or moving beyond that, David had others. Nathan was the prophet that helped him to see God's wisdom and direction. We need those relationships with each other. You could move on through the rest of the Bible um, and see other relationships, perhaps Elijah and Elijah, two prophets that strengthened each other. Or you could move on into the New Testament um, and look at how Jesus develops these relationships with his early disciples, people like Peter and James and John, and, and how important those relationships are for this budding new faith community. You could move on uh, through the early New Testament, folks like Paul and how Paul had a partner in Barnabas that strengthened each other in their ministry for God, or how Paul took on protégés like Timothy um, and helped to strengthen him. All throughout the Bible and all throughout history, we can see how faith relationships bind us and grow us in our faith journey all the way through this morning. I can look out and I can see um, uh, parents and children, um, husbands and wives, um, friends here in the life of this congregation, people who've worked on church council and, and other committees and places, and the fabric of relationships that connects us with each other. Um, in fact, I made the comment last week that uh, this congregation, this church has occupied three different buildings, or even if, God forbid, this building would burn down, we would still be St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Aberdeen because of the fabric of relationships with each other to grow in faith and be about the work that God has for us. It's all about relationships. They're central to a faith community. We see that in 
David and Jonathan. And another thing we see even more clearly in David and Jonathan is that relationships that bless help us reach our potential. We will not be the people of God, and no one will be the people that God wants of us unless it's through the relationships with others. It is not an exaggeration to say that David would not have been the great king, their greatest king that they ever had, had it not been for the protection and the saving power of Jonathan, his best friend. It enabled David to be who he was meant to be. And this is true in our lives as well. I'm sure you can look at your own life um, and think about the people that have helped you in your faith journey. Um, parents and family members, friends along the way, Sunday school teachers and pastors and people you've been part of teams with and and that you've worked with, they've helped you become and are helping you to continue to become the person that God means you to be through relationships. Or if you want to look at an amazing example of this, um, the recent passing of Billy Graham. Um, has, of course, brought many testimonies, and some have commented on the incredible team that Billy Graham built. Um, Some of the people that he worked with um, late in his career started with him at the very beginning. Musicians um, and communicators and publicists, um, folks that he worked with for years. In fact, I read a few years back uh, that they... Uh, so enjoyed and connected with each other that they all bought land in the same area and built houses right next to each other. They didn't want to just be related to each other in their professional capacity, but in their retirement, um, they wanted to be close to each other. Um, In a very real way, if you read about this aspect, Billy Graham was Billy Graham by all of the relationships and the team members who were a part of of his life. Um, We need relationships to help us reach our full potential. It was true of David, it was true of Billy Graham, and it's true of us as well. So then a third thing that I think is worth noting about Jonathan and David And that's their commitment to each other. Both in the text that I read, it refers to covenants. At one point in the Bible, it talks about how their souls were bound to each other. Um, They had this deep commitment to each other um, that strengthened their friendship. Um, And you all know the value of commitment as well. You know that in families, you know that in marriage, you know that in friendships, and we know that in the life of the church, um, that we need a commitment to help each other grow along the way. Um, And in fact, throughout the course of this worship series, um, we're going to have a couple opportunities to maybe make a deeper commitment. Um, One of those things that I'd like to try and see if people are interested in um, is uh, what's typically called like a dinner club. Um, Just if you're interested, um, we'll have you fill something out um, and connect up a group of folks who just go to dinner together. Um, We'll intentionally kind of connect you with some other folks that you may not have met before and get to know each other. Um, That's a commitment you could make. Or another thing that we've been talking about is something like a care caller. Folks that will call folks who have maybe slipped away from worship just to encourage other people on their journey. That might be a commitment that you'd be willing to make to to help somebody else grow. Or at the end of the series, we're going to talk about mentoring. Um, And maybe if you're someone who would be willing to be a mentor or who would like a mentor, we'll see if if we can't connect folks up um, and give you an opportunity to commit and connect because we need each other. I'll say it again. David would not have been David without Jonathan. And we need each other. We need to value our relationships that bless.